Hi, my name is Jennifer. Welcome to my channel. Welcome to my vlog style November wrap up. So today is Friday the 4th of November and I thought I'd update you on what I have been reading so far this month. I am in the middle of reading Dracula by Bram Stoker so I'm about halfway through. I started reading this over Halloween weekend. I thought that would be appropriate and it's going quite well. So Dracula is a book that I have DNF'd before, I think possibly twice. And I think both times I've not got very far into the book. But I don't know why, because it actually gets pretty pacey pretty early on. Um, so, in case you don't know, uh, solicitor Jonathan Harker travels to Transylvania to stay with Count Dracula um, because Count Dracula I think is looking to buy a house in England. So Jonathan goes to stay with him and pretty early on Count Dracula is acting somewhat strangely um, and it's quite funny to read as a modern reader because there's lots of things in there that sort of seems sort of quite OTT when you uh, sort of read it nowadays sort of like <laughs> you know, uh, very over the top vampire stuff. But of course, this is Dracula. Um, so yeah, so I got into it really quickly and I was very much enjoying the vampire -ness. I will say, I felt like for me, there was a bit of a lull in the sort of middle section where we go to England to um, where Mina, who's Jonathan's fiance, is and uh, her friend Lucy and Lucy is very unwell and we um, follow Mina's perspective and a doctor who's looking after Lucy and so on um, and I've done something which I don't normally do and that is I have picked up other books whilst reading this and so far so I read these two then I've went back to Dracula and it's been okay actually I think because it's quite a straightforward story to follow and I sort of stopped at an appropriate point. Um, so yes, it's going okay. I am planning on finishing this in the next sort of week or so. Um, but the books I have picked up in the meantime as well were She and Her Cat by Makoto Shinkai and Naruki Nakawi, translated from Japanese by Ginny Tapley Takamori. Um, so this is a recently published in English uh, Japanese book. It's very, very short. It's sort of five interconnected short stories, but it's not sold in that way. It's sold as a novel and it sort of is, but sort of isn't. Um, each sort of section of the book is about a different character, so a different female character and a cat. Um, and the characters are all sort of, and the cats as well, are all sort of linked in some way as we go through. I did find it a little bit confusing to remember sort of like who was who and how they were related, but that might have just been like a me problem. Um, it's quite sweet. Part of the books are told from the perspective of these different cats, so in first person, which is quite sweet, quite funny in parts. Um, a lot of the uh, like human characters sort of struggle in some way, maybe in fitting in, or maybe they've got problems with their partner or whatever it might be, and the cats are sort of helping them through that. So it's kind of cute. There is some slightly odd stuff. So like, there's a point where a female cat wants to marry a male cat, which, you know, is fine. Um, that's not the weird bit. Um, but the male cat is like, I can't marry you because I've already got a girlfriend. And in this cat's eyes, his girlfriend is his human owner which it's just sort of mentioned a couple of times and that's it but it's just a bit of a strange thing to even like put in there and I know some of the other reviews on Storygraph have mentioned that as well as being a little bit odd um so it was a quick read it was quite pleasant and like I wouldn't say rush out and read it but you know if you like cats then it's, it's, it's all right then I read Heartstopper Volume 4, which I thought was just absolutely wonderful. So this is my favourite, I think, of the Heartstopper books so far. Um, it was just so wonderful. So obviously Nick and Charlie are a little bit older. There is some quite, you know, serious topics going on in here. So there's a lot around mental health, eating disorders, um, self-harm as well. 
and I thought it was just handled in such a thoughtful and sensitive way. I thought it was absolutely brilliant. It did make me cry a little bit, which doesn't happen very often. Um, and I also really liked the way that parts of the story were told. So sort of longer sections are from journal or diary entries from both Nick and from Charlie. And earlier on in this series, we have had some of that, but it was sort of, it was more present, I think, in this, in this volume. And I think it was a really effective way of sort of telling certain parts of the story um i absolutely loved it i am going to now watch the tv series um i really like as well the sort of all the side characters and their stories and at the end of this volume as well there was a little sort of side story featuring uh, some of the teachers at the school where nick and charlie go to which i really enjoyed as well um so yeah i mean if you've not read it you probably have i think i'm the last person to read these um, then you absolutely should hello it's been a few days since i have updated you so i thought it's about time i showed you what i have been reading um first up is a reread the midwitch cuckoos by john windham i really really enjoyed rereading this book i read this for the first time several years ago and thoroughly enjoyed it so this was first published in the 1950s. It's a sort of a classic sci-fi novel. It is set in the fictional village of Midwich, um, which is said to be a small village in England where nothing ever really happens until one day um, all of the people in Midwich all of a sudden all fall unconscious. And it's as if there is this sort of invisible force field around the village and anyone who tries to pass into Midwich immediately falls unconscious, whether they're a person, whether they're an animal. And so we have sort of the police and government agencies and people trying to figure out why this has happened, what's going on. This only lasts about a day and then the people wake up again and seemingly they are unharmed um, apart from like there might be a couple of people who have who happen to be in the middle of a field when they fell unconscious so they've been exposed to the cold all night so I think a couple of people do die for those sorts of reasons but no one is harmed from the actual sort of act of falling unconscious itself um, so things go back to normal and it's just sort of put down to just a very strange occurrence um, until all of the women in Midwich all of a sudden are pregnant, all at the same time. Um, sometimes in circumstances uh, by which they cannot understand how on earth they could have become pregnant. Um, and I won't say too much else about the plot. I don't want to give any spoilers and actually the blurb probably... I mean, the blurb kind of gives away almost the whole plot. <laughs> so I'm not actually going to go into that level of detail. Um, but it's it's a fairly short book. It's quite pacey. It's told from the point of view of this man who is a uh, inhabitant of Midwich. But on the day that this event, initial sort of event of everyone falling unconscious occurs, him and his wife have actually, were out of town. Um, so they were not directly affected by this um, but it's told through his eyes and through accounts that he's heard from other people um, and from people who are involved in, from the authorities in terms of trying to figure out what's going on um, what I particularly like about this book is I really find very fascinating the central concept in terms of the way that it goes which I can't really talk about because it would be a massive spoiler um, but there's just something really really interesting about the sort of the central uh, sort of concept and idea within the book i will say as well that i had forgotten um a lot of what happens in the latter stages of the book so i very much enjoyed reading that um with having no memory about what actually happens um i thought it was excellent this was made into the film the village of the damned which i have not seen um I don't know how true to the book it is, um, but yes, it was excellent. I do like John Wyndham. I've only read a few of his books, but I definitely want to read more of his work. Next, 
I finally got my hands on a copy of Treacle Walker by Alan Garner. So the library finally got this in. Um, and as you are probably aware, this was on this year's Booker shortlist. And it has been, I guess, quite a Marmite book. A lot of people um, who I've heard review it seem to be quite bemused by it, don't really get it not quite sure why it's been shortlisted but then there are some people who absolutely love it so i was really intrigued to sort of get my hands on a copy and see what i thought of it so place your bets now do you think that i love this or i hated it i did of course <laughs> dnf it um uh, it's a super short book it's a super short book and there's like hardly any words on the pages like but um it's like 150 pages. I read about 20 pages and decided that I was not interested enough to persevere. Um, I just didn't get it. Didn't get it. Um, uh, it was like, it was one of them where I understood the words, but the way that they were put together made no sense to me. So I did not know what was going on. It reminded me a little bit of like the BFG because I think there were some like made up name words in here. I mean, I assume they're made up words because I've never heard of them before. I don't know. Um, but yeah, I just didn't get it and wasn't interested enough to persevere. But I, you know, I'm glad I've <clears throat> given it a go because I did want to find out where I would fall on it. Um, then I read Meredith Alone by Claire Alexander um, and I enjoyed this book. I thought this was very good. Um, so our main character is called Meredith. She is about 40 years old and she lives by herself. Well, she lives with her cat called Fred. Um, and we learn right at the start of the book that she hasn't left her home in about three years. Um, but we're not too sure why. As we go through the story, we do find out more about why she doesn't leave her home and sort of the events that have led up to, to that happening. Um, she does have some contact with the outside world. Her best friend Sadie comes to visit her. She's a really good sort of support for it and the friendship between those two characters was really nice to follow. Um, she, uh, Meredith also uh, sort of is in touch with this <clears throat> uh, support group who uh, and someone comes to visit her regularly from there to sort of offer it some support. Um, she has a mother and a sister who both live fairly nearby, but she is estranged from them and hasn't seen them for a very long time. And again, as we go through the book, we find out more about why that is. The book is sort of told in a couple of different timelines. So most of it's told in the present day and then we do get bits which are told from the past but just sort of um it'll tell you what year it is at the start of the chapter and it'll just be like a random snapshot of a few pages from a certain point in the past so for example um meredith's childhood um sort of relationships she's had in the past different things and that builds up a picture of um meredith's background and her as a person and how um, how she's come to be in the situation that she is in today. There are some quite dark and um, sort of difficult themes in here that emerge throughout. So, you know, do check out content warnings on, on Storygraph. Um, but there is also a certain level of humour that runs throughout as well, um, which makes it sort of a really nice reading experience, despite sort of the more difficult things in there. Um, I enjoyed it, I'd recommend it, and I'd definitely read something else by this author. And then I am continuing to read Dracula. I am about somewhere between two thirds to three quarters of the way through. So my plan is to finish this before I pick up anything else because I have been playing a very risky strategy here of reading other books whilst still being in the middle of Dracula. It doesn't normally work for me. I normally end up DNFing a book that I've put to one side. It's not been too bad. And I am intending to, to, to make it to the end of Dracula. Um, I'm finding it slightly slow going. Um, but I'll talk more about my full thoughts once I have finished it. Which, for you, will probably be in about 10 seconds time. 
Okay, so it's now a few days later and first of all I have a confession which is that I, I have decided to DNF Dracula. I was only about 70 or 80 pages uh, before the end but I just found that I wasn't interested to pick it up um, really and I spent a couple of days hardly having done any reading at all because I just didn't want to pick this up so I have DNF'd it. Um, like I didn't hate it at all, um, you know, it's clearly a very good book. I love the gothicness, the sort of atmosphere of it. My favourite part was the beginning section where we first meet Count Dracula at his castle in Transylvania and Jonathan, is his name Jonathan? Jonathan Harker, who's staying with him, um, <laughs> sort of starts to observe Dracula's uh, bizarre behaviours. Um, I thought that was a lot of fun. But then it just... I found it a bit of a slog to get through. I think partly that's the fact of it being told in diary entries and specifically the fact that it's told via the diary entries and journals of several different characters. And for me, I just found it difficult to keep track of who we were hearing from at any given time. Um, and then the one, <laughs> there is one sort of specific thing that annoyed me, which sounds a bit petty. But once I noticed it, I just kept focusing on it and it was really annoying and that it is Van Helsing, the character of Van Helsing and the way that he speaks. Now obviously English is his second language so um, that comes across as he speaks, he makes some grammatical mistakes and things which is absolutely fine. But what was annoying me was he'd say one sentence which would contain a phrase or something that would be grammatically quite complex and then the following sentence, it would be something that is dead straightforward and there'd be an error. And just overall, it didn't seem believable that a character would speak in that way. And that kind of annoyed me. Um, but anyway, um, so yeah, so I did DNF it. I mean, I did then flick towards the end to see, you know, what was going to transpire. But I have officially marked it as a DNF on Storygraph because I didn't properly finish it. But I am pleased that I have, you know, I read most of it um, and I do like gothic literature. So I felt like, you know, I needed to really give this a go. So there we go. Um, and <laughs> I have um, two more DNF updates. Um, the first is a short history of nearly everything. I think that's what it's called by Bill Bryson. Um, and I was reading this for my library book club. So we met this morning actually and no one read the book. Um, I mean, most people like gave it a little go, but not really. And we hadn't really chosen that book ourselves. What it is, we're restricted by the group, by the library reading sets that the library has available and last month what we had to do because of how like the whole reserve list works we had to find a set of books that the library definitely had available for us to pick up um which was why we ended up getting getting bill bryson no one had particularly wanted to read it i quite like bill bryson i've read him many years ago particularly his travel memoirs and i think he's very good and quite amusing but this one is it's basically it's like a 500 odd page book about the history of the universe. Um, I read about 20 pages. I'm like, it's fine, but it just wasn't what I was in the mood for. Um, but despite no one having actually read the book at book club this morning, we still had a lovely time. Um, and then I did DNF another book yesterday, which is The Family Game by Catherine Steadman. Now, so this is a psychological thriller. I have read a couple of Catherine Steadman books before. I read Mr. Nobody and Something in the Water. And I very much enjoyed both of those books. So I was surprised that I didn't really get on with this. Um, the main reason was because it was just the build up to anything interesting happening was just too slow. And it just felt a little bit clunky in its writing style to me. So I did DNF that. However, I have today actually read a whole book. Um, and it is The Skylight by Louise Kanslish. So this is one of those quick reads which is published by the reading agency. So I picked this up because, as I say, I was in the library for my book club and I was early because I'd had an appointment previously um, 
so I got there early, got a coffee from the cafe over the road and then sat in the library, just picked this up, saw it on the shelf and thought I would start reading it. Um, so this is a uh, sort of a psychological thriller. Our main character is called Simone and she lives with her boyfriend in this apartment. And when she looks out of her bathroom window, um, and it's only her who uses this certain bathroom, her boyfriend uses a shower room. When she looks out of her bathroom window, she discovers that she can see through the skylight of their neighbours into their kitchen. So she can see them of a morning at the kitchen table having breakfast. She doesn't tell her husband that she is sort of started to observe these neighbours and one day she uh, she sees something um, through this window and we go from there. I enjoyed it, it was a quick easy read, pacey, a bit twisty and I enjoyed it. Hello again, today is Wednesday the 16th of November and I am having a strange time with my reading at the moment. I'm DNFing books like there's no tomorrow. Even for me, I am DNFing a lot of books. I don't know why. Um, since I last filmed an update, I've DNFed three more books and read two more. So very briefly, I'll tell you about the DNFs. First is The Interview by C.M. Ewan. This is a psychological thriller which has an interesting premise. So this woman's invited to a job interview. She works in PR or marketing. Um, the interview's at five o'clock on a Friday in this office building and um, at the interview things get a little strange and I actually got bored by it Um, there was just a lot of description of her just like running aimlessly around the office trying to find a way out and it was quite boring. Um, My next two DNFs though, these two books I think are probably good books but I just wasn't in the mood for them. The first is Our Share of Night by Mariana Enriquez. Mariana Enriquez is the author of the short story collection The Dangers of Smoking in Bed which you might have heard of. So this is an Argentinian novel translated from Spanish by Megan McDowell. It's absolutely massive, this is so heavy. It's like 700 pages long and I mean I I didn't dislike it, but I'm just not in the mood for this at the moment. So it's kind of quite sort of epic in feel. So it's about a father and his young son. And the father has some sort of power whereby he can somehow communicate with the dead. And he is uh, concerned that this power is going to pass down to his son. And he needs to save his son from um, people who will try to exploit him uh, because of this power. Um and yeah it's meant to be very very good i'm sure it is and the, and the what the part i read was good but i'm just sort of not in the mood for committing to this at the moment and then the other book i dnf is another massive book this is the enigma of room 622 by joel dicker this is um a swiss novel translated from the french by robert bonono this is 500 odd pages long. So this is sort of a crime, thriller, murder, mystery. Um, but the reason I didn't quite get on with it is because it leans more towards the action-y, espionage end of the thriller genre, which is not sort of my favourite thing. Um, and on another day, maybe I would have persevered with it, but I just wasn't quite feeling it. So those are my DNFs. So on to the couple of books that I have read. I read Solitaire by Alice Oseman. So Solitaire is Alice Oseman's debut novel and it features the character of Tori Spring. So Tori Spring, if you've read Heartstopper, you will know that Tori is the elder sister of Charlie. So this is the first book in which Nick and Charlie appear. The events of this book are set after the events of Heartstopper Volume 4. So the reason I was particularly keen to pick this up is because I quite like the character of Tori in Heartstopper. I think she's quite an intriguing character. Um, so I think in this book she's like in sixth form and she is mm, sort of quite a cynical person, a bit sarcastic, possibly depressed. There are references to the Catcher in the Rye and the Bell Jar in here. Um, but the main plot of the book is this anonymous 
group or person called Solitaire who starts posting messages on a blog about the school where Tori attends. And all these messages are in some way linked to things relating to Tori. Um, so we know it's not Tori that's doing it, but we assume, you know, it, it's in some way to do with her. Anyway, um, I started off really quite quite liking the book and by the end I actually actively disliked it. I just didn't like that whole solitaire storyline, didn't work for me. Um, for me it would have been better if it had just focused on, you know, the characters. I mean, this was Alice Oseman's debut novel and who am I to say, um, but... Yeah, I just personally didn't like it, so yeah. But I have read a book which I very much enjoyed, and it's actually my first non-fiction of the year, and it's Ace Voices by Eris Young. So I got this as an arc on NetGalley. It's published in the UK on the 21st of December this year. Um, and it's non-fiction, and it's about ace identities. Um, so the reason why I wanted to pick this up was because I read A Loveless by Alice Oseman earlier this year, which um, made me realise how very little I understood about asexuality and ace identity. So I was keen to pick up some non-fiction in that area. And Ace Voices, I thought, was really, really excellent. So Eris looks at ace identities in terms of uh, the history, the background, different sort of terms and labels and what they mean and also what they can mean for different people. What um, Eris has done in this book is they draw on other pieces of non-fiction, other um, sort of st surveys and statistical pieces, but also in uh, writing the book, they have uh, sent out a questionnaire and 160 people responded who in some way uh, identify as ace and um, the book then contains uh, sort of uh, quotes from these people which is anonymized um you know showing their experiences of being ace so whether that's asexual aromantic demi gray whatever it may be um the book also looks at intersectionality with race it looks at uh, labels and why they can be important but also why they're not always helpful um, I thought it was a really, really great, very interesting, very engaging book. I learnt a lot from it. Um, I am going to do a separate review video on it, which I will link down below if you want to hear my full thoughts, but I would highly recommend that one. Hello again. So I'm in a slightly different uh, location today because I have COVID. I've had COVID for about a week now. So I have been self-isolating in this little bedroom. But I wanted to tell you about the books I have been reading. So apologies for the very plain backdrop. Um, so I've actually got five books to talk about. One DNF, two crime novels, and then two historical fiction books that I read on NetGalley. So first off, the DNF. And I feel slightly bad about this because it's I Capture the Castle by Dodie Smith. So I was reading this with the FOMO book club, so that is Gem of Books, Alice and the Giant Bookshelf and Spread Book Joy. It's a book that's kind of been on my radar for a while that I should probably pick up at some point. I read about 40 or 50 pages and just decided I wasn't really interested. I feel like maybe if I had read this book as a child, you know, maybe I would have liked it and then I'd like to revisit it as an adult, but as it was, I found it slightly dull. Um, so yeah, day left. Um, next we have some crime fiction. So first up is The Therapist by Helen Wood. So this is translated from the Norwegian by Alison McCullough. So this book came to my attention because it was um, has been shortlisted for the Petrona Award. So the Petrona Award is an annual award for uh, Scandinavian crime fiction. So there is a few of that shortlist that my library has, so I am hoping to read them all at some point. So, The Therapist. Main character is called Sarah and she is a therapist. She runs a private practice from her home and her husband is an architect. He works, he set up his own company with two of his friends. And one weekend, he tells her that he is gonna go um, 
like to, away with uh, some friends of his to stay in the woods this is something that he does quite often um, and Sarah gets a voicemail from him on the Friday morning when he's uh, when he's left and um, she gets this voicemail to say you know hi I'm, I'm here I've arrived such a body's here as well blah 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 um, so she doesn't really think anything of it but then later that evening one of his friends who he's meant to be on this trip with rings her and says he hasn't turned up where is he and she obviously tells the friend well he's left me a voicemail this morning saying he was there and he was with you um so what's going on and his friends are like well no he's, he's not here he's not turned up so it's like she's wondering what's going on was her husband lying when he left this voicemail or his friends lying um, what is going on um, to make matters worse when the police get involved sarah for some strange reason has decided to delete the voicemail that her husband left her so um sort of deleting quite a key piece of evidence which the police are obviously not too happy with um i quite enjoyed this book it was quite slow paced i will say which is fine i don't necessarily mind slow paced um and i didn't sort of predict where it was going so i quite liked you know being surprised by where things went i will say for me it just lacked a little bit of a spark in some way that i just would have liked a little bit more from it um, but it was a decent read then for my library book club i have for once read the book and uh, this is dark corners by ruth rendell so this is ruth was ruth rendell's final book to be published it was published in 2015. it's a standalone um sort of psychological mystery so we start off with our main character who is called carl so carl's father has recently passed away leaving um his home and everything in it to carl and uh, carl's father was some sort of like a drug salesperson or something so for some reason he's got like cabinets full of these drugs and medication which carl now owns <laughs> and so one day this happens right at the start carl's friend stacy is talking about wanting to buy some um weight loss pills online and some of the pills that carl has that his father had appear to be these weight loss pills so carl ends up selling like 50 pills to stacy which she takes and then she dies um so it's ruled an accidental death but carl never confesses um, that he was the person who sold these drugs to stacy now the drugs are legal and selling them are legal um but there's something about they're like a bit dodgy basically but the reason carl won't admit that he's sold her these drugs is because he is uh trying to make it as an author and he thinks that if this comes out about him the you know newspapers will never leave him alone and he'll never have a career so we see Carl sort of suffering with this guilt um what I liked about this was the way that it doesn't follow a stereotypical sort of murder mystery plot you know because normally you start off and there's a murder and you're trying to figure out who's done it this is very different and there are various sort of elements to the plot line different people are involved different people who live in the block of flats where, where carl lives um and various people who have we know have different secrets and different things going on and it's sort of as you're reading it you're trying to figure out how are these going to come together how is this related to this so i quite like the fact that it was doing something a little bit different and it put me in mind a little bit of something patricia highsmith might have written that sort of plot line there were a couple of things that let it down a bit for me the first is the blatant fat phobia which ordinarily would be something that would just make me dnf a book but i did persevere because i was reading it for my book club um so <laughs> stacy the girl who dies at the start when people are talking about her afterwards it's like oh she was so fat and she let herself get so fat and her, you know her boyfriend had left her or something and all this and and you know how fat she was not that this, this is okay whatever size she was but she was a size 16 you know 
um and that along with some other stuff just it it, it did feel slightly outdated in, in the way it was written as well um just some of the i don't know gender stereotypes and stuff like that um and then one other thing that that i didn't like was some of the narrative strands i still don't know what they were doing like they didn't seem to really get resolved or bear any relation to the overall plot line so that was a bit strange but overall you know it was fine it was okay and i'm just pleased to have actually read my library book club book for once so next up are the two neck alleys that i read first up and this book is the sole reason that I decided to finally join NetGalley. Um, I read The Secrets of Harwood Hall by Katie Lumsden. So Katie, as I'm sure you're well aware, um, runs the booktube channel Books and Things. And The Secrets of Harwood Hall is her debut novel to be published at the end of March next year. So this is historical fiction set in the Victorian period. And we follow our main character whose husband has passed away relatively recently. Um, so she's a widow, she's in mourning and she goes to work as a governess for this family. So we have a mother and her young son who live in this house, in this little sort of town. And so when the governess goes to live with this family, she finds that the family are sort of um not really a part of the local community and there are lots of rumors about them you know from the um the people who live there um because they keep themselves to themselves rumors about their background where they've come from all that sort of thing um and then the governess herself she herself has some sort of Mm, secrets from her past it's quite clear that she is struggling with to come to terms with stuff that has happened to her as well i absolutely love this book i gave it five stars which i do not give out many five stars at all i absolutely loved it um i loved everything about it um so there's quite strong mystery elements throughout which i really really liked which kept me turning the pages it was really nicely paced as well um and the reveals you know when they came towards the end surprised me i wasn't expecting them and i absolutely loved them i loved the way it went i loved the way the book ended i thought the writing was really great because there are certain words used in terms of phrases used which are just strikes me as so victorian and it was just done so well um, i'm going to do a single review video of this actually so um I won't say too much more um but i absolutely loved it if you like historical fiction in any way at all you have to read the secrets of Hartwood Hall. it's brilliant and then the next net galley i read again is another historical fiction and this is the whispering muse by laura purcell and this is published on the 2nd of february next year so laura purcell has written several historical fiction novels before i think i've read I think I've read most of them. Um, my personal favourite is The Silent Companions. I absolutely love that book. Um, but with Laura Purcell's book, some of them have been not as good as the others for me. The Whispering Muse, I enjoyed. I thought it was very good. Um, it's set in a theatre. So we have a young woman who is um, trying to make money to support her family, so her siblings, because her elder brother has run off. He's eloped with some woman and sort of left the rest of the family to fend for themselves. So our main character um, needs to support her younger siblings. She's got a younger brother who's disabled, who needs money for an operation. Um, so she goes to work in the theatre as like a dresser. So to um, dress the main actress in the plays. The way that the book is structured is in about five or six different sections on each one is when the theatre company are putting on a different play. Um, so for example, a few of them are Shakespeare, there's Romeo and Juliet, there's Macbeth, there's a couple of other things as well. Um, in the theatre, um, we meet lots of different characters. So whether that be um, actors, or people behind the scenes, the owner of the theatre and his wife, um, and there are various sort of 
secrets going on and, and different things. There is some great set pieces in this book. There are some really like quite gory moments. Um, so the main plot circles around this watch, which is maybe possibly in some way cursed because these accidents keep happening happening in the theatre that people are dying in uh, terrible and tragic circumstances um so yeah so i enjoyed that i thought it was good i thought it was an interesting setting i think for me i was slightly let down by the ending just that i wanted a bit more and when i finished the book because i was reading it electronically i thought there was like at least another chapter and there wasn't and it was just the acknowledgements <laughs> so I was like okay I was kind of left hanging a little bit um but no I liked it hello so it's now the end of the month let's finish wrapping up the books I read in November first is Happy Stories Mostly by Norman Erickson Pasaribu uh, which is a short story collection translated from the Indonesian by Tiffany Sao so I actually started reading this collection in June for Pride Month and stopped reading them because I felt like my understanding of the stories was just like a little bit out of my grasp. Like I was just kind of not quite getting it. Um, I feel like that was like a me problem rather than a problem with the book because I could tell that they were really great stories. Anyway, so I put it to one side um, for several months and I've just finished reading the final two stories in the collection, both of which I really enjoyed. Um, so the stories are sort of queer and a slightly sort of odd um, but very well written. This is a book that I would like to revisit in future. I haven't actually given it a star rating on Storygraph because it doesn't really feel fair. I'm not sure how I would rate it, um, but I think I will probably get more out of it on a reread in future. Then I finally read Bitter by Ikweki Imezi, which I've been meaning to read since it was first published earlier this year. This is the prequel to Pet, which I loved. So in Bitter, we follow our main character, Bitter, who is studying at an arts college, sort of like a, a boarding arts college. And the place where she lives, Lucille, is um, going through a revolution. And it's about her sort of not really wanting to be involved in the revolution, but she has friends who are involved. We have some fantastical elements here related to Bitter's art that can in some ways come to life. Um, I enjoyed this book. I really love Akwaki and Mezzi's writing. I didn't like this as much as Pet, but I wasn't expecting to. Um, But I did enjoy Bitter and I really enjoyed sort of revisiting uh, these characters in this place. Then I read Rainbow Valley by Ellen Montgomery. So this is the seventh book in the Anne of Green Gables series. This is actually my first time reading this book. Strangely enough, I read Anne of Green Gables as a child and I read the first six books in that series over and over again. But I did not know at the time that there was a book seven or a book eight. I don't know how that passed me by because I am sure in all the copies I had of the Anne books as a child, I am sure they only ever listed six books in, you know, like in the front few pages when they list the books in the series. So this is my first time reading Rainbow Valley. The only reason I found out these two existed really was because when I was rereading these a couple of years ago, I discovered one of my editions. I just had a mishmash of... Um, different editions you know of the books but one of them had disappeared so I thought I would treat myself to a nice boxed set which sit here on my shelf and that was when I discovered there was a book seven and a book eight anyway Rainbow Valley I thought this was delightful so by this time Anne has six children and um the book is really about the friends of Anne's children so nearby um 
there is a widowed minister who lives with his, I think, four children and they are close friends with Anne's children and it's about sort of the scrapes they get into. Um, we get some side plots with some of the characters that live um, you know, nearby and it was just thoroughly delightful and everything that I want from a book in this series. Then the final book that I finished reading in November, but I do have one more to talk about afterwards, um, but the final one I finished is Swan Song by Edmund Crispin. So this is a murder mystery story first published in the 1940s. We have the main character of Gervais Fenn, who is a recurring character in many of Edmund Crispin's books. Gervais Fenn is a, um, an Oxford Don and an amateur sleuth. Um, so in this book we have an impossible murder so it takes place in an uh, an opera and one of the uh, protagonists is found dead in a room and by first appearances seems to be suicide it's quickly established that that is could not have been the case it must have been murder but at the same time um the evidence seems to show that there was no opportunity for anyone to have got in the room in the time frame and murdered this person. So that's the kind of thing I love. Um, so I enjoyed this. I thought it was good. I liked the solutions when they come. I found the reveal to be quite satisfying and also kind of a little bit, a little bit ridiculous um, and contrived. But I don't mind that sometimes in this kind of book. Um, I, uh, yeah, I, I quite like that. Um, so no, I, I did enjoy this. I would like to read more by Edmund Crispin in future. The only other one I've read is The Moving Toy Shop, which is his most famous novel. Um, and then I haven't finished this yet, but I am about halfway through Marple. So this is fairly recently published. It's an anthology of short stories, which have been written by 12 different contemporary authors. Um, and they've all written a story featuring the character of Miss Marple. Um, so yes, I've been enjoying reading this. Obviously, I've liked some of the stories more than others. Some of the stories I've liked uh, most have been written by Lucy Foley, Ruth Ware and Val McDermott. Val McDermott's story is called The Second Murder at the Vicarage. So Murder at the Vicarage is the first novel in which Miss Marple appears by Agatha Christie. Um, and then in Val McDermott's story, there is a second murder at the vicarage and we have some of the same characters um, that appear in the novel. And I just thought that was uh, quite fun. So yes, about halfway through, looking forward to finishing this over the next week or so. Um, so an update in terms of how I'm doing on my Read What You Own challenge. So I did a video about this recently, which I'll link down below, where I have pledged to read 25 of the books that I own before buying any more books or before getting any more books out of the library. So basically it's all these books here on the shelf are the ones that I am pledging to read. So, so far, I've only started this in the last couple of weeks, so far those three are the ones that I have read from my shelf. So it's a, a decent start and I'm looking forward to reading um, lots more of these books that I have been planning to read for a very long time. So um, I think that's everything for November. I hope you well. Let me know what you've been reading. Let me know if you've read any of these books and what you thought of them. And uh, I'll speak to you again soon. Thanks for watching. Bye.